Masonry's history with America is filled with both mystery and controversy. Because of its secrecy and because its members are bound by terrible blood oaths, Masons are reluctant to come forward with testimony. It's a secret society. It has always been a secret society. And to reveal anything about these secret societies ensures your death. And people who've tried to expose Masonry, even to this very day, risk their lives in doing it. Yet from the shadows, some light appears. When you actually go into Masonry in the first three degrees, why, if you promise that if you are ever reveal any of the secrets of Masonry in the first degree, oh, why, you'll have your tongue uh, uh, cut out and you'll, have your, uh, you'll be buried in the sands of the sea up to the level of your neck uh, at the level of low tide. And at the second degree, uh, I believe they cut out your heart. Uh, and the third degree, they're going to cut out your entrails and burn them. In the 19th century, a man named Captain William Morgan was murdered by a group of Masons who were bound by such blood oaths. Well, Captain William Morgan was a uh, guy up in Batavia, New York in 1826. He uh, was the first American to publish the first three degrees of uh, Freemasonry of the Blue Lodge. The things you had to say, the oaths you had to take. And uh, Masons didn't like that very much. Captain Morgan had vi violated his oath by writing a book to let people know about the terrible oaths of this terrible society. Feeling a responsibility to the Masonic Brotherhood, three members of the order kidnapped Morgan to make him pay for exposing the secrets of Masonry. He was captured by a group of Masons and taken uh, uh, and killed. And uh, later on, the perpetrators uh, made deathbed confessions of it all, so it was all very well known. Of these deathbed confessions, at least one has survived, given by a man named Henry L. Valance, whose insight into Morgan's final moments provides a heart-wrenching account. While Valance was never brought to justice for the crime, his final confession revealed a conscience haunted by a lifetime of guilt. If the mark of Cain wasn't upon me, the curse of the first murderer was. The blood stain was upon my hands and could not be washed out. Valance revealed how a council of eight Masons had condemned William Morgan to death. Council, no, no, no. They made a decision and decided your fate. Are you ready to pay for your betrayal? Talk to me, man. I've done what was right. And how Morgan had pleaded for his life on behalf of his wife and children. He commenced wringing his hands and talking of his wife and children, the recollections of whom in that awful hour terribly affected him. Please, my children, my wife. And his wife, he had said, was young and inexperienced, and his children were but infants. You should have thought about that before you turned us in, before you wrote the book. May God have mercy on your children, because we will not have mercy on you. Despite Morgan's plea for mercy, Valance and his fellow Masons were determined to carry out their grim task. They gave Morgan time alone to prepare himself to die. How Morgan passed that time, said Valance, he could not tell, for everything was quiet as a tomb within. When they returned, they bound his hands and led him away to the awful fate they had prepared for him. story was he was actually drowned uh, after being mistreated horribly for a period of time. Well, when the word of this got out and people began to realize this dangerous influence of masonry within our society, why the membership of the organization fell off dramatically. As one uh, investigator put it, as one writer put it, uh, Freemasonry, free which was rampant throughout the country at that time, almost dried up overnight.
The public outrage over Morgan's death was profound, but when those who had murdered him were sought out, the people of the United States discovered that justice was not so easy to obtain. The reason was given by the Reverend Charles Finney in his book, The Character Claims and Practical Workings of Freemasonry, first published in 1869. Finney was a former Mason who lived through the Morgan affair. He claimed that justice in the case was impossible because nearly all the civil offices in the country were in the hands of Freemasons. According to Finney, even the newspapers of the day were completely under their control. Finney writes that it was found that they could do nothing with the courts, with the sheriffs, with the eyewitnesses, or with the jurors and all their efforts were for a time entirely impotent. So this turned into a big brouhaha. It was a big Masonic scandal because it was all known. The Morgan incident became an issue of national importance, not simply because a man was murdered, but more importantly, Americans began to realize that their supposedly democratic country was being secretly controlled by the Masonic Brotherhood. And this led even to uh, uh, separate political parties, being anti-Masonic political parties being formed. And they were even called the Anti-Masonic Party. They were in candidates for president. And they were significant parties. They weren't just minority parties. So it was a really big deal. The Anti-Masonic Party was the first third party in American politics and eventually became the Whig Party, which is more widely recognized. The party itself was led by former president John Quincy Adams, who wrote a collection of letters and essays against Freemasonry. How can you have a free society when you have people who belong to these secret societies and have sworn these terrible blood oaths? You can't have a free society. And that's what John Quincy Adams was writing about. Adams wrote, I do conscientiously and sincerely believe that the order of Freemasonry, if not the greatest, is one of the greatest moral and political evils. As a result of the Morgan incident, a series of official investigations took place. In 1829, a New York State Senate committee published its findings on Masonry, stating that its members were found in almost every place where power is of any importance. Five years later, in 1834, a joint committee in Massachusetts reported that Masonry was, quote, a distinct independent government within our own government and beyond the control of the laws of the land by means of its secrecy. Well, the influence of Masonry uh, has always been here since those days. And of course, within 15 or 20 years, why uh, the, the membership of Masonry had reconstituted itself. It said they, they got down to only about 5,000 members there when Masonry was really exposed. But people soon forgot about uh, the, the terrible things that had happened. And the fact that if you were a Mason, they really would kill you. Most people look upon Masonry as simply a oh, fraternity and these oaths have no meaning. But tragically, they do. A monument was erected in Batavia, New York, and remains to this day, in remembrance of what happened to William Morgan. The inscription on its base reads, To the memory of William Morgan, a native of Virginia, a captain in the War of 1812, a respectable citizen of Batavia, and a martyr to the freedom of writing, printing, and speaking the truth. He was abducted from near this spot in the year 1826 by Freemasons and murdered for revealing the secrets of their order. The monument goes on to tell the reader where they can find the historical records that document the Morgan account. Why would the citizens of Batavia have gone to this length? Crimes are committed every day and people sometimes murdered. Why draw attention to William Morgan? Did they desire to warn future generations? Was it because the people of that time recognized, as Charles Finney asserts in his book, that America was being controlled by Masons from behind the scenes?